Well, thank you all for coming. Um, return with us now to those wonderful days of World War II in Tyson's Corner, Virginia. I know a guy who farmed the land around here back then. He raised wheat. He used mules in a place that nobody had ever heard of before called McLean. This guy is named Till Hazel. <laughs> Appreciative laughter from the guys who know a little bit about Tyson's. Till is the foremost developer in these parts of the 20th century. He created much of the Washington metropolitan area as it exists today, including Tyson's and everything else. And Till was arguably did more to shape the built environment of the Washington metropolitan area than any man since Pierre L'Enfant. And I'm not so sure about L'Enfant. And he's still alive, and he remembers this building here. It was universally known, he says, as, quote, the beer joint, end quote. And these two little roads here, nobody had ever heard of them either. They were Route 7 and 123. All right, so here is Tyson's today. What happened? Well, what happened was the automobile, the jet plane, and the corporate computer. These three forces totally reshaped cities worldwide, and Tyson's boomed because Tyson's was optimized for the automobile, the jet plane, and the computer. So as a result, Tyson's became the largest urban core between Washington and Atlanta. And this all happened in the blink of an eye, in a generation, in living memory. So this raises some questions. Is if you've had a revolution this big so soon, is Tyson's forever? Does Tyson's have a future? You know, is there something else that's going to come on and revolutionize it? I think the data shows that that's exactly what's happening. I think you're seeing that we're creating brand new kinds of cities as revolutionary as Tyson's was 30 years ago. Only this time, these new places are spread all over the planet and they're far, far away from any of the conventional metropolitan areas like ours and certainly on the far side of the moon from a place like Tyson's. Uh, I call this the Santa Fe of the planet. You can also call it Edge City 2.0 if you wish. And this is Santa Fe, New Mexico. The interesting thing about these new cities, this new Santa Fe, is that these places are not by the stretch of the imagination suburbs. They are not sprawl. They're way too far out for that. Instead, what they are are new places that are digital, digitally empowered by the internet in a strange way. You know, as you know, just about everything can be digitized today. So that means that the stuff that can't be digitized becomes rare and thus exceedingly valuable. And two of the things that these places epitomize that included in this, one is beautiful scenery, but the other is face-to-face -face contact. You're not going to be able to digitize face-to-face -face anytime soon. And face-to-face -face is crucial. You need face-to-face -face for trust. You need face-to-face -to, -face to create love. A lot of times you need face-to-face -face for fun. So therefore, the places that are great for face-to-face, -face, I think, are the ones that are going to thrive in the future. And the ones that are lousy at it, they're going to die, period, full stop. These are the cities that are going to die. Think about this for a minute. You look at the near horizon, and what do you see? You see a world in which everything is smart, gigabit connections are ubiquitous, and of course, there's the marvelous robotic car, which you know, is going to become a date center like no other. And, and, the, and you know, when, as this, all this stuff happens, people are going to increasingly start being, realizing that they can live just about anywhere. You know? They can live and work and play and pray and shop wherever they want. And so, but this anywhere doesn't mean everywhere. What they want is urbane. They want sophisticated, but not necessarily with urban. So think urbane without urban, and you get back to Santa Fe here. Santa Fe is the classic example because, for example, it is a world-class opera center, right? This is the Santa Fe Opera House. 
It also has sophisticated restaurants, charming architecture, uh, excellent secondhand boot stores, uh, quirky bookstores, spectacular mountains, great diversity, and it's tiny. It's 70,000 people, far, far from any major metro. So you know, it turns out, I guess, small is beautiful. But the question is, how can this possibly be? All right, now we go back to history a little bit. This was Washington, D.C. in the 1980s. Then I was a reporter and editor at the Washington Post, and I wrote a bestseller called Edge City, Life on the New Frontier, in which Tyson's figured prominently. And for this, we drew this map of the edge cities in Washington. Now look at all these little red dots. This is the most concentrated place in the world for these edge cities. Every one of these red dots is larger than most of the old downtowns ever were on their best day. Every one of these red dots here in the Washington area, for example, had five million square feet of office space and up. Now that's a ton. And this means high quality white collar jobs. All right, each one of these red dots was bigger than Memphis in this regard. Okay, but office parks do not a new kind of city make. So you also have to provision all your worldly goods. So this gets to shopping. And each one of these red dots also had at least 600,000 square feet of retail and up. And again, this is more shops than most downtowns had in their finest day. It was a medium-sized mall, not to mention you know, the two giga malls here in places like Tyson's. So the question I had was, well now, if look at this concentration of new kinds of cities. What does this mean to Washington? Where is the economic power center here? Well, here's what you do. Imagine you've got a waiter's tray, and imagine that you're holding them on your fingertips. And this waiter's tray is in the shape of the Washington metropolitan area, okay? Suppose you have an endless supply of little weights here. Each of them are equal. And suppose they represent a high quality white collar job. Suppose you take these weights and you put them on the tray wherever they're geographically located, one by one, throughout all these edge cities. And then when you finish with that, you decide you're gonna lift this tray to find out where it balances on your fingertips. And the answer is three miles east of here. This is now the economic center of the Washington metropolitan area. DC is the fringe, Tyson's is the center. This was quite the revolution. So what's up with that? And the answer is that all cities are always shaped by whatever was the state of the art transportation device at the time. If the state of the art was shoe leather and donkeys, like at the time of Jesus, what you get is Jerusalem, right? Because donkeys have these sharp little hooves. So they can go beep, boop, beep, boop, boop, straight up these hills. Fine, that goes great for Jerusalem for 1,600 years. And then the state of the art becomes ocean-going sail and wagons. And you end up with a brand new kind of city like Boston here or Amsterdam or like so many others. And it's an entirely different kind of city. And then you ask planners, well, all right, that's fine. You have a revolution in cities. What happened to Jerusalem? And they have a technical word for this. Uh, they say that Jerusalem was screwed. <laughs> Fine. Okay, so you, uh, you then, all right, so you look at Boston, and then you say, well, what was the big revolution after ocean-going sailing wagons? And the answer was the railroad. What happened? Well, you end up with another revolution, another brand new kind of city, like Chicago. And uh, you say, well, what happened to Boston? And the planners say, well, it was screwed. <laughs> and so you say, well, but what was the next step after that? And they say, the jet passenger plane. You say, well, what happened? Okay, is anybody here a baseball fan? Okay, 1955, where was the southwesternmost baseball team major league in America? 1955, southwesternmost team. Anybody know? St. Louis, excellent, you're right. St. Louis, now think about that. that what was up with that? Well, what happened was that you couldn't possibly have a, t a team any farther southwest than St. Louis if you were trying to make a schedule and getting them around at railroad speed. You just couldn't get it any farther. That was the significance of the jet passenger plane for the entire economy. With the rise of jets, all of a sudden, you had world-class cities in 
Dallas, Denver, Houston, Atlanta, Phoenix, ultimately Sydney, Beijing, and all that. And you realize, okay, well, that was a real big deal. And so what happened? What's the next big step? I think the next big comparable step is the internet. And I think the result of this is the Santa Fe of the universe that I'm going to be talking about. I mean, think about what the internet allows us to do, for example. All right, all of us have got laptops and, 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 uh, and smartphones, right? So increasingly, you know, we can, re I mean, this is the, our, our, our curse, right? This is that we can work from anywhere, and anywhere that we are, we're working, right? And so after a while, you begin to realize, well, now, why do I need an office tower if I can operate like this? Why am I commuting on the beltway if I can work like this, you know? The, uh, so that's when people start asking themselves, well, how about, I mean, why don't I work someplace that I would enjoy? Same thing goes for shopping, you know? Why, you don't need malls anymore. Anything that you can buy on the internet will be shipped to you. We're in the freight revolution, right? Santa Claus comes in a big brown truck. He'll bring you, you know, weapons grade sashimi tuna, you know, wherever you want, you know, anytime. So you don't need malls anyway. So the question is, all right, if everybody decides that the mountains and the oceans start looking pretty good, uh, what happens to Tyson's and, what, and places like it? Well, we're already beginning to see this in the commercial real estate industry here, right? You've probably seen in the paper how many empty office towers are being converted to apartments. And, you know, and you're seeing that there are no new edge cities that have been built in the last 20 years from scratch. And of course, you're getting dead malls. So you ask yourself, well, have we stopped building cities or are we replacing them with something new? And the answer, I think, is something new. I was looking at some numbers a few years back and I suddenly realized that the number one metro in America in terms of real estate appreciation, people getting richer than stink with the house, price of their houses just skyrocketing, was Wenatchee, Washington. And I thought I knew this continent pretty well, but I thought, where the hell is Wenatchee, Washington, right? Well, it turns out that it's three hours east of Seattle on the dry side of the Cascades, and suddenly it made sense. Seattle is full of good jobs, Microsoft, Gates Foundation, Amazon. But as my daughter puts it, Seattle is one of those, it gets rains all the time. So it's like being married to a beautiful woman who's always sick. And, you know, you, you, you. So people are looking for, for, for a little sunshine. They discover Wenatchee, they go for the weekend, but they've got their smartphones and their laptops. And they thought, you know, so forever, when lovers go someplace tonight, they say, why are we going back? But now we've got a really new, reason, really new question in real estate. Why are we going back? So instead of leaving on Saturday, you start leaving on Thursday. Instead of leaving on Sunday, you start leaving, you know, staying there till Tuesday, and that's the revolution. That's when you're spending more time in this new kind of city of Wenatchee, working and playing and living, than you are back in your edge city in Seattle. And, you know, but this is not just any place. These are places that are good for face-to-face. -face. And you look at the new census numbers, and all of these places are these, these this is where the, the growth is exploding. You know, where is Georgetown, Texas? Turns out it's in the hill country. Really nice. Where is South Jordan, Utah? Well, it turns out it's between the Ochre Mountains and the Wasatch Range. Now look at this place. It's like a cross between the 18th century and the 21st century. It's like we're waking up from our nightmare of, of industrial age cities and recreating something like Monticello with broadband. Okay, so come back to my statement about how the only places that will thrive are the ones that are face to face, good for, and, the only, and otherwise they'll die. Does that mean that all these edge cities are dead? No. Reston, for example, as you can see, is pretty good at face-to-face. -face. But then you ask yourself, Maryfield? Prince William County? You know? And then you ask yourself about the downtowns. Are they all going to die? Well, no. Here's Adams Morgan. That's good for face-to-face. -face. But Camden? Meanwhile, you know, where you're actually seeing the big explosion is far, far from any place that's a conventional big metro. 
you know, and locally what you're seeing here is in the Blue Ridge Mountains in the Piedmont of Virginia, an hour and two hours and more from here. And this goes from Middleburg to Charlottesville. And that's where you're seeing this explosion of these Santa Fe's in everywhere from little Washington to Madison, Virginia, that until recently were really country. And here's Warrington, Virginia, which is in Fauquier County. And it's at the heart of the Santa Fe and country. And it's great for face to face. And you know who lives there? Till Hazel, who lives on 3,000 gorgeous rolling acres. So I asked myself, OK, what does this mean for Tysons? If we're going through the biggest revolution in how we build cities since the, since the original revolution in Tysons, does Tysons have a future? Or is it screwed? Good question. What do you think? Thank you very much.